this is the UBC Learning Circle. Um, we are uh, based out of the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. Your song is on. located on unceded traditional territory of the Musqueam people. And we're very happy to have uh, Jerry Kasten here today, along with Angela McIntyre and Kathleen uh, from Healthy, uh, who is the Healthy Eating and Food Security Specialist at the First Nations Health Authority. Thanks so much for joining us. Jerry Kasten uh, is going to be uh, presenting um, a wonderful menu that I'm extremely <laughs> excited about. It smells fabulous. Uh, this is a, a, a great uh, a choice of a various uh, fall ingredients, including uh, beets and uh, delicious traditional recipes that are reworked that I'm sure you're going to love. Uh, we are in the Foods and Nutrition building today in Vidge's Kitchen, uh, which is right uh, at UBC. Um, and uh, without uh, further ado, I'd like to just turn it over to you, and I'm excited. Thank you so much. Okay, we're all set. That was the intro. Okay. <laughs> so, welcome everyone. We're so excited to be here. So thankful to the Musqueam for their stewardship of the lands for these many generations. Uh, so today, we're just going to get right into it. What we're, we're starting off with is making a beet gazpacho. So of course, I have some beets, and I'm just going to cut those into like one inch pieces and fire them into a bowl over here. So some nice beets. I have about, it's officially it's one pound of beets. So uh, with this size of beets, it was about six beets. And of course, I have beet hands already. We were peeling the beets, and it was a bloodbath. <laughs> um, so what we're doing is, once we've got the beets all cut up, we're going to roast them. So we have a lot of beautiful red vegetables. So we have our beets. We have just some radishes. So I'm going to put those in whole, because they are about the same size as the one-inch beets. Same thing, we have a beautiful red onion. I'm just gonna cut the root end off of that. We have a big barrel of composting here. And the same thing, we're just gonna cut that into about one inch pieces and fire that in. Uh, we have some beautiful red peppers. So I like to go down one side, then the other side, and then each side and then the bottom. And that just leaves you with all the seeds. And we have some. Kathleen's being my Vanna today. <laughs> That's why I invited her. Although she has important things to tell you. Important, very important things to tell you. But we'll save those for later. So again, just some nice big pieces of pepper. We have a uh, torchier. This, um, our recipe for the beet gazpacho came from a live magazine. And uh, I'm actually really pleased with it. Turned out really, really well. So all we're doing is cutting those up. And then the last thing I'm going to put in is some garlic. So we're going to do our peeling garlic demo. And if you're listening on headphones, you might want to take them off. So I just push down on that garlic, uh, a big whole head of garlic, and I'm just breaking it into individual cloves. And so you can see I've got the garlic in a metal bowl. And I'm going to take another metal bowl and put it on top. And I'm going to hang in. This is where it gets loud. And now all the garlic. 
garlic is peeled. So, fun for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's what you can get your kids to help with. Yeah. <laughs> They'll be very happy. They'll be very, very happy. It's noisy and productive. And you ask them to do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Noise that you ask them to make. <laughs> okay, there's all the peels in there. So now we got like a dozen cloves of garlic. I'm gonna throw about four in with my beets and we'll just put the rest aside for a little while. So all I do here is pour on a tablespoon or two of oil and just toss this. And what the oil does is it coats all of the beets and all of the onions and, and it really makes a difference to the browning. And of course, browning means flavor. Okay. Yeah. So now we have a roasting pan or a baking dish or whatever you want to call it. And we're just going to pour that on there. That's right. Good work. <laughs> so we'll just pop this into the oven. We have it on at 425, and we'll leave it in there for about, let's see, about 30 minutes. So I'm going to put the timer for 15 minutes. And on. Nope, that didn't work. There we go. I'm gonna, and after 15 minutes, I'll just give it a stir. Okay, next what we're gonna make is we're gonna make some Saskatoon crisp because, of course, any kind of berry is a great idea. So we have roughly three cups or so of Saskatoons. Uh, and this is just absolutely a great year for Saskatoons. I'm just going to extend that a little bit by adding some apple to it. So I got some of our lovely BC apples and uh, these ones are ambrosia. So Kathleen, yes. fall, as I know it, is canning time. Mm -hmm. What do you know about canning? Not so much, but I'm learning a lot. And I'm learning a lot from our communities all over BC. And I think a lot of, um, a lot of members out there are doing a lot of canning of, from all their beautiful berry harvesting this year um, and whatever they've been able to harvest. Um, I know it's also been a, a hard year for many communities with the fires, so, um, but a lot of people have um, been talking about also fish and all of their um, harvested game meat as well, from moose to deer, um, whatever traditional foods um, that you harvest in your areas. So we've, we've done a lot of, um, we're starting to, at First Nations Health Authority, have been uh, creating a curriculum on um, on canning, uh, but also really trying to get traditional foods into schools and different settings and community gatherings, and making sure that you know people feel confident and safe about it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the work we're doing with communities. Uh, there's a lot of great champions out there that are doing and leaders that are doing great work in their communities and doing a lot of teaching and. Um, we're really learning a lot from them um, and just trying to uh, bring their work up and, and have them teach more people in their regions. That sounds fantastic. Mm. Uh, so what I've got here is I have my uh, Saskatoon berries and I'm just going to put in... I'm just going to put in a quarter cup of sugar. So I just like to put in sort of a heaping handful, is that's my quarter cup, because I'm just 
I don't always have my measuring cups. <laughs> and then what I like to do is, a lot of people like to use flour to thicken their crisps and their crumbles, but I really like to use minute tapioca for a couple of reasons. One is that flour, flour makes a very cloudy, um, cloudy liquid. And the minute tapioca keeps the liquid really, really clear. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is that it's all the rage these days. It's gluten free. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we just took that quarter cup of sugar because there's sugar in the apples and of course there's sugar in the berries. And we're just gonna mix our berries and apple and the tapioca to thicken everything. And then we're gonna make some crumble. So what I have for crumble is I have a cup of rolled oats and I have about half a cup of flour. And then I'm going to use some brown sugar or some golden sugar. <laughs> and so I like to put in two tight fistfuls. Just one tight fistful, two tight fistfuls. And that's somewhere between half cup and three quarters of a cup. So uh, most of the sugar in this dish is actually in the crumble part. And then the other thing we're gonna mix into here is about half a cup of butter. So this is a half pound of butter. So the great thing about half a pound is that half a pound is one cup. So a half of a half pound is half a cup. It's a miracle. <laughs> so we have, it's nice soft butter because we've had it sitting out at room temperature. Although as we've all noticed, it's frightfully cold in this room. <laughs> so it's actually not all that soft. Not that room temperature-ish. That's right. And so all I do with the butter is work it with my hands into the flour and the rolled oats and sugar mix. So what have you been doing to help support communities in their canning efforts? Um, so we just partnered with the Greater Vancouver Food Bank, um, and they have a great train the trainer course. So it's something similar like this, where you have a, a large kitchen and people um, get up and get to do the actual training um, around canning. So people feel when they leave, they feel like, okay, I can do this. This is very manageable. So we did both the hot water bath method of canning, which is for um, the high acid foods like fruits, um, berries, uh, apples, applesauce. And then um, for the low acid foods, we also tried the pressure canner, which a lot of people are pretty nervous about if they've never tried, because there's a lot of stories around, you know, <laughs> things popping up, things getting out of control and all that scary pressure. Um, just getting out of hand. But people tried it out, they got to work the pressure canners, and I think everyone came out of that workshop really confident about using it, so that's exciting. Um, yeah, so a lot of hands-on. Um, and then our environmental health team also do, does a food safety course. Um, so we've been matching that up with um, the canning, so everyone in the community is kind of from harvest to actually the canning, they feel really confident about the whole process. That sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. So you took that just recently? Yeah. Yeah? That was really fun. So how was pressure canning? It was... Scared? <laughs> it was actually really manageable. <laughs> like, it just made some, like, funny, like, that whistling noise that it does. Um, but you also know that's all the goodness, and once it's done, then, you know, you've got some good salmon or good um, meat to last you for the winter, which is super exciting. Um, although many people say it doesn't last the winter because it's <laughs> and it gets eaten. <laughs> so. so you guys can all answer in the chat box, what size do you like to can in? Mm -hmm. See, I'm just a single fella living all by myself. So I like to do my salmon in the 250 mil containers, mm -hmm. right? But I talk to a lot of grannies and they're like, 250 mil. 
bottles. <laughs> <laughs> I use the one liter containers. <laughs> and we did learn from the food bank actually. Um, they were saying that they've learned through the years that for for safety reasons, they do try to do up to just 500 mils mm -hmm. because the heat doesn't always go right to the center with with the one liter. Like we don't tell people what to do at home, and I know a lot of people have been doing the one liters for a long, long time, and that's you know. But that's for the community gatherings or if it's to be distributed. That's kind of their safety kind of um, advice on on um, canning and the size of. Yeah, and it's pretty sensible. Uh, mm -hmm. I like the 250s because you just get a fish and you cut it into pieces that long yeah. and one fish fits beautifully into the 250 mil container. Yeah. That's why I love them. <laughs> yeah, Any that's response, what we can do. Davina? Not yet. Not, Not yet? yet? No. Right out the question. Okay. Okay. So our Saskatoon crisp is all done. And the great thing about crisps is you can use any fruit, right? Certainly it's wonderful when berries are in season. But what I really love is apple crisp or pear crisp. And then the winter time, you could use canned fruit. So you could have peach crisp or apricot crisp. You can also use dried fruit. So dried apricots and apples actually make really lovely crisp. And in the springtime, you can make one of my favorites, rhubarb crisp. <laughs> and of course, as my wise old dad said, there is no dessert that is not improved by ice cream. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> I'll nice. turn that over to you. I'm just going to give my hands a rinse. Okay. The next thing we're going to do is we're gonna what is the next thing we're gonna do? Do, 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 do yeah we're gonna put some squash on to roast so we have a beautiful red turn this way we have a beautiful red curry squash so we've cut that all up into one in one inch pieces so that's one red curry squash and they're the they're just beautiful it's such a nice year. We have our little decorative pumpkin. This is my pumpkin. I'm going to take it home and turn it into pumpkin marmalade because it's not like, don't buy those big Halloween pumpkins and think that they're going to make really delicious pumpkin something because they have no flavor at all, right? They really take a lot of uh, added oomph to, to have much flavor. So these little sweet pumpkins are really, they really make a difference. Now I got a couple more ambrosia apples. So I'm going to cut them up and add them to the squash. UBC has a really wonderful composting system. So, when I was a kid, I just really didn't like squash. Because my sainted mother was not the world's greatest cook. <laughs> and so we got squash boiled in a pan, mashed with a potato masher, and flung onto your plate with a spoon. There's your squash, eat up. <laughs> and uh, strangely, I never liked that. <laughs> and so then one day someone sat me down and roasted some squash and I could not believe it. I could not believe how delicious squash is when it's dry roasted. It just makes such a difference. So today we're just adding in uh, not just any old onion, but this is actually a sweet onion. So the sweet onions, they come all through the year, but all from different places. Right now we actually have some BC sweet onions. How's this doing? Oh, 
it's not boiling. <laughs> Let's turn it back up. Um, of course, the most famous onions, sweet onions, are from Walla Walla, Washington. And uh, the onions from Walla Walla are very, very sweet because they have no sulfur in their soil there. So the onions grow really sweet because of the lack of sulfur. So that really makes a difference. I'm going to throw a few of our, uh, I think this time I'll just cut them in half, a few of our cloves of garlic in here. So we have some BC sweet onions, and they're really lovely. They're so mild that you can pretty much, like, you can eat them in a sandwich or something like that. And again, we're going to do just like we did with our beets, and we're going to pour in one or two tablespoons of oil and then toss it. Now, a lot of people, they will mix spices in at this time. I don't like mixing the spices in this early. Uh, I love to mix in some spices, but I like to do it a bit later because if you mix them in really early, I'm just gonna add just a touch more oil. If you add them in really early, then because of the oven temperatures that you're using to roast the vegetables, the spices will often burn and then you have not so delicious little burned nuggets of spice. So I like to add the spices in about halfway along. So there's our squash. And we're going to roast this. What's, what's ding in now? Oh, the, the beets. OK, that's perfect. So this one goes where? There? No, that's the Saskatoon. Oh, back, oh, in, there. back in there. OK. I'll give them to you again, and I'll give the other ones a stir. So our beets are approximately halfway there. So I'm just going to pull them out of the oven. We just give these a quick stir. You can see they're really steaming. It does. Looks really red. <laughs> oh, oh no. One of our peppers fell on the floor. I'll just give it a quick rinse and fire it back. Okay. There we go. Okay, what we've been peering at in our little pot here is we have some wild rice cooking. So we'll just let that continue to simmer. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put Kathleen to work cooking some meat. So uh, this is just ground meat and you can use any ground meat. We're going to make tortillere. So with the meat, uh, this one, I'll have to light it. This is like, it's so high tech. The piezoelectric is broken. So we have this little sparker to light these. More hair left on my hands, isn't that strange? <laughs> so all we're gonna do here is we have some, I, like I said, I use pork beef. You can use moose, you can use deer, you can use rabbit. I know that some people have ground bear and they like that. So really you can use any ground meat that you have at home. And we're gonna mix that with just one chopped up onion and then all good things have sage. So we're just going to take a few leaves of sage. There we go. That's not very up. 
There's some sage. And we're also going to add just a little bit of savory, maybe a teaspoon or so of savory. And then I actually have some cloves. And so I'm going to take a pinch of cloves and just add that pinch of cloves. So some savory and some sage and some cloves. And we're just going to cook this up. And once it's cooked, you can add some mashed potatoes to it. So maybe you have some cold leftover mashed potatoes, and that's a great thing because that thickens it. And all we're going to do is we're going to saute this for about 20 minutes or so. Now the other thing I'm going to do is oh, show you my choke cherry jelly. <laughs> so uh, to, this was a fantastic year for choke cherries. The choke cherries were hanging like grapes on the thing. I'll send Davina, I'll send you a picture and you can post it online. And Use it for future, <laughs> use it for future sessions too. The choke cherries were just heavy on the trees this year and they were just beautiful. So I picked about a kilo of choke cherries in about 20 minutes. It was just, you just grabbed it and dragged your finger down and they just all fell into your bucket. It was just wonderful. And so I took those and I added about a cup of water to a big pot and brought it all to a boil and boiled them and then put them in a jelly bag and strained out. But then I did something <clears throat> that might be a bit different. A lot of you I know will use Serto. I'm moving close to the camera so you can see this. Um, but I really wanted to talk about this, which is Pomona's Universal Pectin, at the risk of sound, like sounding an endorsement because I made five cups of choke cherry jelly. So five of these 250 ml containers. And in that, I used half a cup of sugar. And that's what the great thing of, is about the Pomona pectin. It's not like the usual commercial pectin where you have to add three quarters of a cup of sugar to, uh, to each cup of juice, three quarters of a cup of sugar to each cup of juice. He says, look over here, show these people the Pomona pectin. <laughs> There's the Pomona pectin. And because this is a different kind of pectin, it's calcium gelled. So when you open it up, you get your recipes. <laughs> so you get a big thing of recipes and that tells you how to make jams and jellies and everything. And then you get your big package of pectin, but then you get a little tiny package, and this is full of calcium powder. And so you mix the calcium powder with water according to the directions, and then you mix the pectin with whatever sweetener you're using. You can use no sweetener at all. That's one option, right? And there's instructions on how to use no sweetener at all. Or you can use a different sweetener besides white sugar. You can use things like uh, honey, or you could use stevia, or you could use, um, whatchamacallit, sucralose. What's it called? Um, anyways, the sugar substitutes. Don't use aspartame. <laughs> Just because aspartame breaks down in heat. And if you use aspartame, then it won't be sweet like it's supposed to. But I just use sugar because a half a cup in five cups of jam, that's like nothing. So, uh, and it really lets the flavor of the fruit come through. So that's why I really like this particular pectin. And you know, I'm, I don't like endorsing things, but I, this is the only kind of that pectin that exists. And it's a lot different than things like Serto Light and a lot of the other ones, which they're very fussy. Very, very fussy recipes. Whereas with the Pomona's, it's not fussy at all. You just kind of mix it and sweeten it with whatever sweetener you want to use. And you can make jam or you can make jelly. Any of those are just fine. So that's my choke cherry jelly.
Okay. We have a question, Jerry. Yes. Is it a, is it a Canadian product? No, I believe it's American. Okay. Let's see. Greenfield, Massachusetts. So it is an American product, yes. Uh, it's available, I have seen it at Savon Foods. Uh, I bought it at the East End Food Co-op because I'm such a hippie. <laughs> so I was like, I like to shop at the East End Co-op. Looks like we're getting close mm -hmm. here. It's smelling good. Yeah, it is, it's smelling really tasty. So what we've got here is we have a pie crust. So you just add some mashed potato to this. And then, you may as well just add it in, right? Yeah. Let's just turn it off. See this, when you're a cook, you get strong. <laughs> so the thing about tortier is that tortier is specifically a meat pie. There's hardly any vegetables in it, right? We have, we have some uh, onion in there and a little bit of mashed potato. But truly, tortillere is a meat pie. So we just take our meat pie and we have another pastry to put on top. There we go. going on in the background here. <laughs> okay, perfect. And so I'm just going to pop this into the oven. It's the oven. Yeah, there's an extra, there's an extra thing in there. Actually. And through the magic of television, <laughs> we have our tortier. So our tortier is all ready. We'll just leave it over here. Do, do, do. We'll do, see? That's how men cook. <laughs> you leave the dishes for someone else. <laughs> okay, so our tortilla is done. We have about five more minutes on our beets. So what I'm gonna do is just check this. Where's the... Still not done. We have some wild rice on cooking. Oh, well, no wonder it's done. It went out. <laughs> so what we're going to make is we're going to make some wild rice and Brussels sprouts. So again, I'm going to put some oil in the pan here and set this cooking. Now we cleaned a whole bunch of Brussels sprouts. So what I want to do is coat the whole pan with oil. I want the pan to be really nicely coated with oil. And we put that on a nice high heat and we have all these Brussels sprouts and they're all cut in half. So I'm gonna put them face down. Do you wanna help Kathleen? because we're going to brown these on one side. And then, like everything else we're cooking today, we're going to roast them. Because that's fall. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, and the nice thing about roasting in the fall is because, you know, the house is getting a bit chilly, but you don't really want to turn the heat on yet because, like, oil's expensive. <laughs> and so, the uh, using the oven uh, really heats up the kitchen and there's just nothing like the warm hearth to make people feel like home. 
the smells are great too. Mm -hmm. We have about a pound of Brussels sprouts. So if you have a big fry pan, like I'm fortunate enough to have, you should be able to fit pretty much that whole pound in here. Oops. reaching our limits. Okay, and so all we're gonna do is let those brown. So, what else do we have? We have our beet gazpacho, and it's on the roast. We have our tortillera in the oven and out of the oven. We have some roasted squash with apple and onion. And uh, we have our wild rice and Brussels sprouts. So I'm just going to step away. You know what you should, you should tell folks while I step away? Should I? You should tell them about First Solid Foods for First Nations yes. babies. <laughs> My favorite. So First Solid Foods was created by um, Health Canada. And it's gone through several iterations. And um, it has a lot of... Uh, baby food recipes and um, that's made from scratch and homemade and a lot of times uh, looking at how to accommodate food that you're eating and um, some methods and ways to bring that to baby food so you can all eat at the table. Um, and Jerry's uh, been really loving this resource so at First Nations and Health Authority we've decided to um, make it our own and make it more uh, for our BC First Nations uh, communities and um, and also bring some recipes and stories around baby food and how everyone does it. So right now we have an online survey uh, that's collecting these stories and recipes um, and so if you see a survey that's being passed around please fill it out. There's a prize for a baby carrier um, and yeah that should be coming out in the new year. And, yeah. mm -hmm. it's, uh, if you don't already subscribe to the First Nations Health Authority eBlast, then that's a great way to get information um, like this because they get regular updates. And so you just go to the fnha.ca and what, click on news and then scroll right to the bottom yeah. and there's a subscription link. Yeah, sign up. So that's a really, really great way to subscribe to the First Nations Health Authority eBlast. So I'm gonna do a couple things here. I'm gonna take my basil. Uh, I need to get another, another blender. I'm gonna make some basil cream. So I have all of my basil. So it actually calls for a cup of basil, so there, a top. <laughs> Pretty close. Pretty close. Uh, so I'm going to take a cup of basil, and then I got some. Uh, what's this? Soft tofu, silken tofu. And so I'm just going to open that up. And the reason that I make this with the silken tofu is that it does a couple things. It adds extra protein, recycling, and it also makes it creamy, but without um, a lot of fat. So. Should I turn these? No, no, but are they brown? No, not yet. <laughs> but we can turn them down. There we go. Okay, now no one can talk because <laughs> we're gonna make a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. uh, where are we? It takes a couple of tries to do this.
that's it. Now we have some basil cream. So the basil cream, of course, is brilliant green. And it tastes like basil. <laughs> so that's for our um, beet gazpacho. So the beet gazpacho, what we do is we take about half a cup of um, sun-dried tomatoes and put those in. We take a cucumber, half a cucumber. If I can get it out of its special wrapping. This stuff is like steel. <laughs> it's really, really hard to get off. There we go. Oh. So half a cucumber, and I'm going to take our roasted beets, and onions, and garlic, and peppers. And I'm going to put those in here. Oh, and radishes, right, all of our red stuff. So we have our sun-dried tomatoes, we have a half cucumber, we have our pound of beets, and our red onion, and our two red peppers. Are they brown now? These uh, Brussels sprouts? Okay, you can take them off the heat. There we go. So what I'm going to do is add about, the recipe says a cup, but I've learned that it takes more like two cups. So there we go, two cups of vegetable broth. Do, do, do. And just a pinch of salt. So I've got about a half teaspoon of salt and a little bit of pepper, some fresh ground pepper. Just checking that I have everything in there. Oh, right. So one of the things they suggest adding is red wine vinegar or sherry vinegar. Now, I personally would never use red wine vinegar or sherry vinegar. I would use red wine or sherry. <laughs> but I also know that there's a lot of people who prefer to keep their foods alcohol free. So the other thing I brought along is I made some Saskatoon vinegar. So I just bought, bought Saskatoon, so went out and got Saskatoons and boiled them up with a whole bunch of apple cider vinegar until look, vinegar turns purple. And so I'm just gonna add a couple teaspoons of Saskatoon vinegar to that. Just to really keep it nice and sharp. The other nice thing about the vinegar is that the vinegar actually keeps it really nice and red. Okay, so again we go. mostly pureed, I'm going to add in, again, just a couple tablespoons of oil. Too thick, 
which this is, <laughs> then just add some extra vegetable stock. You want it to be soup consistency, not baby food consistency. So all you do is put that in the fridge and keep it in the fridge for anywhere up to a day. That it needs to be nice and cold. And There's our beautiful beef gazpacho. So, now we have our cooked Brussels sprouts. Looks like our wild rice is not almost done. We're gonna take this, reuse our pan. Oh, a beet. <laughs> And we're just going to finish cooking these Brussels sprouts in the oven. I think the squash is ready. I don't know. I'll look in a moment and we'll see. Now you can see that Brussels sprouts have this beautiful browning on them now. So anytime you have that wonderful browning, you have delicious flavor. So we're just going to fire these into the oven. And that only takes uh, about um, 10 minutes or so. How's our time? Oh, we go to 11.30, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not quite. Mm -hmm. No. Should be brown. <sighs> and what's up with our Saskatoon crisp? Oh, that's, that's over here. <laughs> <laughs> it smells good. What you guys can't all see is that we have like 100 people back here. <laughs> and we have our entire technical crew who's like, mm hmm, no one else here to eat this. Thank God for webinars. I think it could use a little bit more. Yeah, I think so. Um, and so, let's dish out some of our, let's see, what do I need? <laughs> we have some lovely, I'm, gonna, I'm all done with chopping, I believe. So we have some lovely dishes. So Love the color of this. Mm -hmm. 
and it's just this beautiful deep red. So if you wanted to be really fancy, you could actually take your basil cream and you could put it in a piping bag and make little designs, right? Or if you don't have a piping bag, all you need is a bag. You can just turn it inside out. Roll it down. Take a couple spoons and then twist it. And then what you can do, so you can see I've just twisted the bag and I've got the corner of the bag. And so you just nip the very corner off. If you need a little extra pressure, you can just roll the bag up a bit more. Okay, that's not coming out anymore. And then you can take a knife or whatever, and if you draw a line through, and the last thing we'll do is sprinkle on some pumpkin seeds. So we have toasted pumpkin seeds with beet gazpacho and basil cream. <laughs> oh, I know what it's doing. It just reached the temperature. So there we have some beet gazpacho with barley cream. Next thing that we have uh, is the squash isn't quite ready, is it? Almost there, <coughs> and that's not quite ready. So we have our tortiere. So when the squash comes out, I have some lovely rosemary to to um, season it with, and then some Parmesan cheese. This is, uh, I love to get Parmesan, a block of Parmesan, and grate it myself because then you get nice big lumps, much more grated texture because the powdery stuff that you get commercially is powdery. It's just powdery. <laughs> I'm not really totally behind it. <laughs> um, let's go for the squash. Ready? 
Let's just bring it out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we have a dearth of pot holders. Wonderful. So we have our oven roasted squash with some apple, some onion, and garlic. Rosemary. I always like rosemary because it smells like spruce needles. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's really nice too. And then some Parmesan cheese. Now you could use any cheese. The Parmesan is nice because the white contrasts nicely with the orange of the squash. But if all you have around the house is some old cheddar, that's just fine too. So there's our squash. I'm just gonna take our wild rice and it's fully cooked now. So take out the bay leaf that we had in there, and I'm just going to grab another dish. There we have our wild rice, and this truly is a Canadian product. And Brussels sprouts are over there. Okay. Oh, they're right in here. Excellent. I'm just going to shake on a little bit of balsamic vinegar. Now the thing about balsamic vinegar is you can buy the expensive stuff if you want, which is fine. <laughs> but what I do is I buy the really cheap stuff 
and then buy two bottles and pour both bottles into a saucepan and just bring it to a boil and let it boil until it fills one bottle. In other words, reduce it by half. And what happens is, is the natural sugars of the vinegar really get concentrated and you get a beautiful glaze that you can use to glaze all kinds of foods. So there we have our wild rice and Brussels sprouts. And is that everything? Oh, we have our Saskatoon crisp and it's, it's not quite ready. So we have our beet gazpacho. You know what we can do is let's take a few of these pumpkin seeds and put them onto the squash as well. Okay, so now what we can do is we can invite all of our background people up to the front and they can help you guys imagine what this food tastes like. <laughs> so we have uh, Davina, and Davina is our, oh, here it is. Oh, that looks fantastic. Just tilt it up a bit. There's our Saskatoon crisp. Mm -hmm. Davina's our techno person who runs the webinar for us. And you met Aurelia, and I don't even know your name, Javier. Javier is with us today too. And Roger, is it? Yes. <laughs> Roger is doing our video conference technology. And Angela is here, and Angela is a specialist for healthy living for the First Nations Health Authority. So come on, you guys. <laughs> you can see the big crowd of people that have been here delivering this webinar to you. Here's Roger. Oh, we can take, let's take the dirty dishes out of the way. <laughs> it's like, that's the thing I'm very best at, creating dirty dishes. <laughs> so, I think that's it. So we're a little bit early, but thanks so much for everyone for joining us today. We have, like I said, we have our beet gazpacho, we have some tortillere, we have roasted squash with apples, onions and garlic, sweet onions and garlic, and we put some rosemary and Parmesan cheese on that. We have our wild rice with roasted Brussels sprouts, and we have some Saskatoon crisp. So thanks very much for joining us today, and uh, all of the recipes will be posted online by the end of the day today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yay.